The PlayStation Vita, a necessity for gracious living. The portable gaming market has historically been a difficult one to crack for any company that doesn't have a mustachioed Italian plumber for a mascot. Sony had a pretty good college try at knocking Nintendo off the top of the ladder with the PSP, but ultimately, even the might of the momentum of the success of the first two PlayStation consoles was not enough to dethrone Nintendo from their rather comfortable seat atop the handheld mountain. Despite selling over 80 million units more than any other non-Nintendo handheld, the PlayStation brand would suffer their first ever loss in the console war. Sony may have won over a lot of gamers with their impressive handhelds, but Nintendo went one step further and managed to convince a lot of people to buy their DS, who had never even considered gaming before. Sony PlayStation products may have made gaming more appealing to adults, but Nintendo through the DS and Wii era managed to sell their products to generations even older than Sony had even considered. Kids and grown-ups love it so, the elderly world of Nintendo. Outraged and disgusted by this, Sony obviously felt like they had something to prove because it wasn't long before the Japanese tech giants were at it again. In the words of Obi-Wan Kenobi, strike me down and I shall become more powerful than you could ever imagine. And that they did, bringing to the market by far the most powerful handheld gaming device, not only that the world had ever seen, but the world would ever see for quite some time. I'm not sure if it was bravery or outright determination to rectify previous wrongs, but once again Sony were back to compete in an attempt to steal away Nintendo's handheld crown. Could Sony do what they failed to do with the PSP and finally dominate that elusive portable gaming market? Or would their next handheld console crash and burn even harder a second time around? Well, I think we all know the answer to this one, but let's dig deeper and explore exactly how a handheld that would appear to be so beautiful would mark arguably the PlayStation brand's biggest misstep to date. That's right bitches, today we're going to be examining the history of Sony's second portable gaming device and trying to figure out just why it didn't sell, why it didn't live up to expectations and why it had to be discontinued so early. I am Lady Decade and I am asking why the xylophone buggery did the PS Vita fail? Last week, we went into extensive detail about the backstory, the development and the trials and tribulations of the Sony PlayStation Portable, better known as the PSP. Although by no means an outright failure, Sony's first swing of the bat in the handheld market was a definite disappointment and ended up having a much shorter shelf life than the Japanese video game and electronics giants had hoped for. 80 million units may sound like a lot, but this is the PlayStation brand that we are talking about. So considering the money that Sony had invested in this, they expected significantly better results. Despite moderate international success and some strong home field success in Japan, partly due to the release of multiple titles in the insanely popular Monster Hunter series, the PSP was simply not sustainable and Sony had to pull the plug. It was no secret within the industry that Sony still had designs on cracking the handheld market and rumours of a PSP successor began to circulate as early as July of 2009, several years before the PSP had even stopped production. Eurogamer reported to the world that Sony were working on a technologically superior portable gaming device that would make use of a power VR processor and be capable of performing graphical feats on par with the original Microsoft Xbox. 
the rumour mill continued to stir over the next 10 months or so, with numerous magazines and websites claiming to have seen evidence of the mythical Bigfoot-esque PSP2 throughout late 2009 and into 2010, but with nothing concrete or official actually being reported. Things started to gain a little more traction when, around the time of the 2010 Tokyo Game Show, words broke out that Sony's new handheld device had been unveiled privately during an internal meeting at Sony Computer Entertainment's headquarters in Aoyama. This was shortly followed by similar exciting, albeit not officially confirmed, news that development kits for the new system had already been shipped to several first and third party devs, with the ball on both software and hardware very much already rolling. The first actual confirmation of Sony's new handheld's existence came from EA Senior Vice President Patrick Soderlund, who told the press he had indeed seen one, but couldn't comment on any of the details about it. November of 2010 gave us the biggest news yet, when British video game blogger VG247 released pictures of an actual real-life prototype of Sony's PSP successor to the public. The system was being used as a dev kit and it featured a sliding screen not too dissimilar to Sony's PSP Go design alongside twin thumbsticks, four face buttons and their oh so familiar PlayStation alignment and a large D-pad. Good news on the twin sticks as the lack of a second thumbstick was a huge problem for the original PSP, particularly in its later years, but there wasn't really anything out of the ordinary there. What was interesting was the inclusion of a microphone, front and rear facing cameras and a touch sensitive back pad. It seems clear that Sony were looking for as much modern functionality as possible and were keen to have their new device be able to perform similar tasks to mobile phones and portable multimedia devices. The intimation that the sliding screen seen in the photo was also touch sensitive only lent further weight to this theory. Were Sony looking to cater to the mindless Angry Birds and Candy Crush Saga mob with their new device? No. Thankfully not, although perhaps the poor Vita would have been more successful if they had gone down that route. Sony's plan was to combine the experience of big budget gaming that one would get from high-end modern consoles with the type of portable experience found in games played on modern smartphones and tablets. Sony Computer CEO Kazuo Hirai stated that Sony intended to appeal to a wide demographic of people by using many different input methods on this future hardware. The leaked prototype photos were quickly followed by the news that the sliding screen design had been changed due to developers having issue with units overheating. The new model was said to have a look and feel more similar to the original PSP, but with all the fancy extra bells and whistles from the system in the leaked prototype photo still intact. Sony's new, as yet to be officially named device was officially announced at their PlayStation meeting press conference on the 27th of January 2011. Referred to only by the code name Next Generation Portable, Sony let it be known that this new system would be a handheld capable of PlayStation 3 level graphics. I mean, holy wow, PlayStation 3 graphics on the go, sign me up. But wait, don't get too excited, as that was almost immediately debunked and clarified as something we shouldn't take too literally much to the chagrin of many members of the press. David Coombs, who was a research manager for Sony at the time, said, Well, it's not going to run at 2 GHz like the PS3 because the battery would last for 5 minutes and it would probably set fire to your pants. Surely a few burning pairs of pants would be but a small price to pay for such a glorious device. Nah? Sony essentially confirmed what we already knew when they revealed that the system would have a 5-inch OLED touchscreen and a rear touchpad coupled with regular old tactile buttons and pads that you can actually physically manoeuvre and press. 
They also broke the news that their new handheld would have a mix of both physical and digital games released for it. The 2011 Game Developers Conference saw even more details about Sony's innominate new handheld come to light, as they would let it be known that they were ditching those pesky and unreliable UMD formats used within the original PSP models in favour of teeny tiny game cartridges that would come in both 2 and 4 gig varieties. Sony's poor little nameless handheld finally got a real name to call its very own on the 6th of June 2011 at the 17th E3 event, when Sony officially announced the PlayStation Vita, with Vita being Latin for life. Sony's explanation for this somewhat contrived name is wonderfully pretentious, as apparently the Vita enables a revolutionary combination of rich gaming and social connectivity within a real-world context. Sony Computer Entertainment is aiming to transform every aspect of your life into an entertainment experience. God, if this was a Guru Larry episode, insert Peter Molyneux joke here. Despite rumours that the 2011 Japanese earthquakes had significantly slowed the production of the Vita, Sony confirmed that they were still very much on schedule for a late 2011 Japanese launch, with other international regions following shortly behind with a supposed launch date of February 2012. This was later pinned down to the 17th of December 2011 for Japan and released on the 22nd of February in America and Europe. Things were looking fairly promising on the software front too, with well over 100 games being touted for release either close to or on the console's actual launch. There seemed to be an awful lot to get excited about on the Vita front, and when the system finally launched in Japan for around 25,000 yen for the Wi-Fi only model and 30,000 yen for the upgraded 3G version, critics were almost universally positive about its design, operating system and features, although some did express concern about how the Vita would compete with mobile devices and tablets, and what place it actually actually had in the market in 2012 and beyond. Those slightly troubling questions would prove to be more persistent over time, but the Vita's impressive graphical specs and launch lineup of 26 games in Japan and 25 in North America served as enough of an initial distraction to the system's potential shortcomings. First week sales were extremely positive in both Japan and the USA, with Sony managing to shift over 300,000 units in the land of the rising sun and 200,000 in North America. Not bad going at all. And the, dare I say, sensational lineup of both first and third party developed games over a wide variety of genres played a huge part in that initial success. Titles in the popular Wipeout, Rayman, Plants vs. Zombies, Blaze Blue, and Marvel vs. Capcom franchises, amongst others, were included, as well as FIFA, F1, and MLB games for sports lovers. Several brand new exclusive titles developed specifically for the Vita with its various input methods heavily featured, with the cherry on top and biggest selling point being the brand new AAA Uncharted game that could only be played on Sony's latest handheld. This was seen as the system's first killer app, and was praised by critics upon release, particularly for its story elements and similarity in scope to its console counterparts. But many bemoaned the over-reliance on gimmicky controls, which they felt dragged the pace of the game down and hampered the overall experience. Unfortunately, this was an issue that would blight many of the Vita's games. After the initial strong system sales of week one, figures would drop rapidly and disastrously as early as the second week of release, with sales plummeting by a shocking 78% in Japan, leaving only around 12,000 Vitas being sold on a weekly basis. Bloody hell! 
Although the 5 inch OLED screen in a 16 by 9 ratio was large and beautifully clear, there were mobile and tablet devices being sold on the market with even larger and even clearer screens that could be made available for much cheaper than the cost of the Vita and had a much larger and more varied list of games. That's not even taking into account that many of the games available on those types of platforms would be free to install too. It seems the initial fears about where or how the Vita would fit into the portable gaming market of 2012 were very justified. For the Vita to be a truly viable and profitable alternative to what was already on the market, Sony projected that they would need to sell 10 million units by the end of March 2013. As the title of this video will no doubt suggest, they fell significantly short of accomplishing this goal, having sold only 4 million units by the end of 2012 and with sales continuing to decline. There are no official numbers beyond this date, as Sony probably rather smartly neglected to make the Vita sales public beyond the 4 million mark. Although analysts have estimated that they managed to flog a grand total of 6 million units by the end of 2013. Not a terrible or embarrassing amount by any means, but given the level of competition, not only from mobile devices and tablets, but also from a Nintendo's latest split-screen party pooper, the 3DS. Those sorts of numbers are spelt doom, gloom, and a lack of sustainability for Sony's little portable powerhouse. It wasn't looking good for the Vita, and extensive surveys showed that both Western and Eastern consumers were disenfranchised with the product. Japanese consumers were unwilling to invest in the system due to its high retail price and perceived lack of software variety, while American consumers noted the decline in sales and marketability and felt that the product's shelf life was extremely limited as a result. I should add here that the perceived lack of software variety was a little misleading and possibly the result of poor reporting or biased journalism. The idea that the Vita barely has any games is an enduring one, but is also a bit of a Mandela effect to be honest. When you take into account that all the physical games, AAA titles, digital only games, indie and homebrew releases and countless ports from various systems, there is no shortage of fantastic software to get stuck into on the Vita. You might just need to know the best places to look. Regardless, this preconception about the Vita's lack of games haunted it throughout its existence and was one of the primary factors behind its poor sales early on. Sony managed to briefly turn things around for the Vita a little from early 2013 onwards, mainly by altering the demographic that they were targeting and shifting focus away from the mainstream side of things. They aimed the system at the more hardcore gaming market, with far more focus being put on obscure indie games and mid-level Japanese developed games with a niche appeal. They also capitalised on the success of their Big Boy console by adding crossplay and connectivity functions with the system's hardware and their troublesome handheld. It definitely got people talking about the Vita again and brought it some much needed relevancy to the little thing, but none of this really affected sales in any kind of meaningful way. The same could be said of Sony's decision to release a revised, more cost-effective Vita variety to the public, which rectified some of the issues found in earlier models. Unfortunately, the decision to swap out the OLED screen for an LCD one was seen as a bit of a downgrade when it came to picture clarity, and the PCH2000 never really had much of an impact on sales. The Vita enjoyed some brief periods of legitimate success in both Japan, America and the UK, but it was always fleeting, with only an estimated total of around 16 to 17 million units sold 
during its entire lifespan. Considering that the PSP sold around 80 million units and was still considered a failure, it really tells you all you need to know about the Vita's shortcomings. It's worth noting that the drastic shift in the market didn't only affect Sony, with Nintendo reporting similar drop-offs when contrasting the DS's sales figures to the 3DS's, but Sony simply weren't in a position where they could get away with persisting through that sort of financial instability and had to discontinue the PS Vita in early 2019. Now, from my own personal perspective, I picked up a Vita after it had been reduced in price in 2014, as I found the idea of playing one of my all-time favourite games, Final Fantasy X, on the go very exciting. So, that was good enough reason for me to invest in a Vita, and as amazing as this handheld was, in many ways, the hardware was still plagued with a few issues that irked me that I could never actually get past. For starters, I loved that I could download so many games from the OG PlayStation library, especially bearing in mind what an important part of my childhood that system was. However, playing the original PlayStation games on the handheld was easier said than done, as a number of issues made the experience less than comfortable. Perhaps most annoyingly, those pathetic touchpads on the back of the device in place of actual physical buttons functioned horribly. So, the part in Final Fantasy VIII, for example, where you have to escape from the Black Widow outside the Dolit communication tower was practically unplayable. As to run away, you have to be able to press L2 and R2 simultaneously. Good luck with that and those bloody touchpads. I turned the game off. Another complaint I had relating to downloading games for the hardware was the storage of them being an absolute ball ache. The problem with this and why it's so difficult is because rather than store the games on a cheap SD card like you would on a phone or a switch, Sony on the other hand expected consumers to pay out regularly for extremely expensive proprietary memory cards which essentially would often leave a sour taste in my mouth as I had to delete games off of my device each time I wanted to play a new one. At the time I simply couldn't justify buying more than one of those memory cards because I didn't love the Vita enough to do that. Anyway, back to the video, in a lot of ways it's a miracle that the Vita even lasted that long. But the incredibly high attack rate of software sold per hardware user meant that Sony's little black bundle of joy was a very viable place for game releases, even taking into account the small install base. It's a great system for collectors who love having physical versions of games, as a lot of small indie companies such as Limited Run have made the effort of porting numerous highly sought after titles to the Vita. Sony's shiny little handheld also managed to remain somewhat relevant by being an absolute hacking and emulation beast. The wonderful form factor and fantastic screen make it an excellent choice for playing all those naughty little illegal ROMs that we would obviously never encourage ever on this channel. Overall, the Vita was and is still an amazing bit of kit with an almost limitless amount of games. It was perhaps too good for this world, filled with mindless mobile gaming and microtransactions, and was taken away from this mortal coil far too early. The Vita did manage to hold on during its final years and stay alive longer than expected, but the poor thing was pretty much written off from day one by the mainstream consumer. All things considered, it's probably about as close to a perfect handheld as we'll ever get, but it was still an abject failure. I think that tells you all you need to know, really, just about how hard that market is to crack. So, I am Lady Decade, and that was the story of how 
the PS Vita failed. If you enjoyed this video, then please like, subscribe if you're not already, hit the notification bell, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. Videos like this would not be possible without the very generous backing I get from my beloved patrons. So, without further ado, shoutouts go out to William J. Scott III, Carl Thomas, Sebastian Velez, House of the Ted, Boyd Chan, Big Papa Pickles, J. O'Malley Drone, T. Bo Baggins, Sir Landry Does Gaming, Christopher Divieo, Richard Turnbull, Green Cooper, Frank 1982, Eric Hendricks, UK Kraut Gaming, Anthony Ryan Bennett, Brent O'Hara, Stephen Quinn, Autumn Breeze, Timothy Hansmer, Ryan Dacker, Dizzy Koala, Sandbox Larry, Awesome Jacket Dude, Triforce of Shadows, Johnny Holly, OPC, EmuMovies.com, PWND Games, Consoles, Accessories, Corey Uderkirk, Ben Harradine, Gasper Heller, Sedgmeister, and Ago as well as all of the rest of my lovely patrons. Thank you all so much.